says this machine helped sweeten America's diet. What is industry doing about the shortage of teachers? When does a printing press mix pleasure with business? How does glass pipe help our milk supply? Industry on Parade. Peabody Award winner for public service, produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. In the shadow of Utah's Rocky Mountains, a mechanical harvester takes the hard work out of digging sugar beets, until very recently a task that could be accomplished only by hot and tedious hand labor. It's an extension of efficient mechanization to the fields, which annually contribute almost a billion pounds to the nation's sugar bowl. As cane played an important part in the development of the South, sugar beets are linked with the growth of our Intermountain West, where they took an early place in the region's fast-growing economy. It was Utah that put into operation the first beet sugar factory to be constructed by American workmen using American machinery back in 1891. Today, in the same state, Five modern plans transform this major cash crop into sugar, using processing equipment as up-to-date as the new machines that harvest the beets. Along with similar factories in 20 other beet sugar-producing states, they form an industry that's the most efficient in the world in terms of man-hours required to produce a given quantity of sugar. At the Utah and Idaho Sugar Companies plant in West Jordan, the process begins after the beets are shredded the thin strips are treated with hot water, which extracts a sweet juice containing about 12% sugar. There's further treatment of the juice with a slurry of lime and water in carbonators through which carbon dioxide bubbles. Then in a series of filter presses like this, the impurities are drained off before the juice, by now much thicker, is pumped to the pan floor for further concentration by boiling under vacuum. About one pound of powdered sugar is injected into the liquor to start the crystallization, and the result is about 94% sugar at this point. There are constant tests of samples by the expert sugar master, who uses his knowledge to keep the juices moving from one step to another at just the right time. Should he make the slightest error, a whole batch might be ruined by hardening in the pan. Only when all conditions are exactly right does the sugar move to big centrifugal drums, which spin off more liquid at the rate of 1,100 revolutions per minute. The crystals that remain are washed with distilled water, and the sugar finally moves on to revolving granulators where hot gases will dry the finished product, a product which has been subjected to exacting laboratory tests all along the line to ensure strict quality control. These men work with a two-in-one crop, for the beet produces not only sugar for human consumption, but a variety of byproducts, highly valued as livestock feed. Thus, the industry supports two important parts of the Western agricultural community livestock feeding, as well as sugar farming. From mechanized farms comes a crop, modern factories turn into a variety of sugar products that put energy into America's diet, as well as America's expanding economy. Industry believes that one of the major requirements for the success of a free economy is that there must be a steady flow of investment capital, private capital provided out of the savings of individuals. With more than $12,000 of business assets behind every job in industry today, and with an increasing population requiring a million new jobs a year, we must prevent and eliminate interference with the basic processes of capital formation. These are the processes which make the new jobs possible. These are also the processes which raise the standard of living. At an American university, the scientists of the future listen to an expert lecture. But something is missing from the picture. There are not enough of these students. 
And there's a shortage of teachers, too, of men and women qualified to instruct enough additional young people to fill the gap between the number of scientifically trained graduates and the number of openings they're needed to fill. These are twin problems, receiving increasing attention from leaders of industry and education determined to correct the situation. Profoundly concerned about the scientist shortage, Arthur D. Little Incorporated at Cambridge, Massachusetts has come up with a new plan conceived by company president Raymond Stevens who explains it here to two recently graduated teachers of high school science who will participate. The firm hires both of them. But one of the new employees goes to work in the local high school. And the other goes to work in the laboratories of the firm, a research and consulting company. This arrangement continues for one semester. After that, they switch, alternating back and forth over a period of three years. In this way, the plan helps the school get a science teacher needed to help fill the shortage in the classroom. And Arthur D. Little Incorporated gets a research worker. It's a program that helps boost teachers' salaries while improving the caliber of instruction and qualifying teachers for part-time work in industry. By alternating this job in industrial research with classroom teaching, Miss Callahan in her first year out of college will earn more, and the research job will help her become a better teacher. His semester of teaching over, Charles Battett replaces Miss Callahan at the research company, joining the large staff engaged there in solving problems for companies, many of which have no research departments of their own. In turn, Miss Callahan will go back to teaching. This is to be her permanent career, for the program's primary aim is to improve the quality of the teaching of science, a critical need as we move into our industrial future. A successful businesswoman gathering the raw materials from which she has built a prosperous enterprise. In the North Woods around Frankfort, Michigan, Gwen Frostick sketches the beauty of the landscape she loves and reproduces it in picture form for customers who send orders to her combined shop and store from as far away as New Zealand and Venezuela. In pencil, Miss Frostick transfers her nature sketches to linoleum blocks, one block for each of the colors that will be combined to form the final print. The same hands which skillfully carve these outlines were crippled by polio when she was a child. Doctors told her she would never be able even to write. The business she operates today is testimony to the success of her determination to overcome the handicap. Each block is locked into place in the chase of a printing press, the framework that will carry it into contact with the paper. For each color, an additional press run is required. College trained in the art at graduate level, Miss Frostick first put her talent to work producing designs in metal. When the war brought a shortage of copper, she joined the tool and fixture designing staff at Willow Run, later went into printing with the intention of making stationery from her linoleum blocks but she soon found she was spending more time printing formal cards, invitations, and the like than the pictures she loved so much. And that's when Miss Frostick moved to Frankfurt, determined to concentrate on the greeting cards and notepapers that give her the medium she finds so suitable for self-expression. Now she makes her dreams come true, spending part of each day helping fill the orders from customers around the world and devoting at least one hour each day to walks through the woods and dunes that line Lake Michigan shores. On these walks, she looks for new material to add to the variety of scenes and subjects she likes to share with others. There are so many orders now that a staff is employed to help Miss Frostick ship out the products of the little plant. Delicate impressions of scenes she finds within walking distance of her home and shop, reproduced by a woman whose talent and determination seem to prove success often can result from mixing business with pleasure.
The number one health problem facing industry is the common cold. According to the U.S. Public Health Service, the toll from the common cold is over 150 million work days lost annually, or more than all other work stoppages combined. However, industry, through the Common Cold Foundation, is doing something about this troublesome problem. Scientists believe that in the foreseeable future, a vaccine against at least one family of cold germs can be perfected. Through industry-supported research, the problem of the common cold appears nearer a solution than at any time in the past. Industry on Parade visits Skygo Farms in Fulton, Missouri to see how a modern dairy uses new methods and machines in the production, processing, and packaging of quality milk at low cost. In an air-conditioned milking parlor, accurately measured feed is cranked out from the floor above. The temperature of the solution used to wash the cows in preparation for milking is controlled automatically. After preparation, the machines take over, feeding the milk into receiving jars that hold 38 pounds apiece. With this spotless equipment, two men can milk 50 cows an hour, a long step from the drudgery of days gone by. Now let's follow the milk as it flows through clear glass piping directly to the processing department. Here, milk is heated to 135 degrees, then homogenized, heated to 175 degrees, and finally cooled down to 40 for packaging. A control panel includes a graph that maintains a constant record of temperatures used in pasteurizing. Automatically, the milk is packaged in sanitary cartons at the end of a processing line 10 years in the planning. It's a complete dairy system that includes distribution too, so that owner Henry Danuser can be sure his grade A product is fresh as it reaches the consumer. From the insulated cold of the loading room, the cases go into delivery trucks containing four-cylinder refrigeration units. In this particular operation, there's no door-to-door -door delivery. The dairy concentrates instead on distribution through local stores and a sales system based on the same principle of automatic operation featured at the plant. Attractive drive-up vending machines make the milk available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, courteously and silently handing out change when required. From cow to carton, the milk she buys is untouched by outside air. A modern dairy uses techniques of industrial production and marketing to maintain premium quality while avoiding the need for a premium price.